Welcome back to Plastic Weekly. Uh, Christiane Marceau is the executive director of Climbing Escalade Canada. She assumed the role in the early days of 2020, obviously not knowing what she was about to get into. Um, for the better part of uh, the decade preceding that, she was involved as an athlete and a coach and an administrator for Ultimate in Canada, which is another very fast growing sport. And now about a year into her tenure as the ED in uh, Canadian climbing, we finally get a chance to talk to her and see how things have been going through this very unpredictable uh, uh, year of 2020 and now 2021. Christiane, I really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, thanks for joining us. Very well. welcome. Thanks for the invite, Tyler. Yeah. Um, in those early months as you were just coming on board with the CEC and getting comfortable, what were your first impressions of the organization uh, and the sport itself? Because you were making a big transition from uh, from a really different type of, like you came from a team sport for one. That's a big change. <laughs> yeah, indeed. I, I got to say, like I'm, I'm coming in from a different sport and different community, but I when I first attended my when I attended my first climbing competition in December, I went to the Eastern Regional. I saw a lot of similarity, despite the fact that it was individual versus team sport. But I saw a community that looks alike, that has the same value, that have the same ideals of the kind of sport that I I really connect with. So that community sense, that value, that spirit, that respect, that camaraderie. I saw all of that from the gecko and that really got me very optimistic about this new position and this new role and getting to know more about this this sport that I wasn't very aware of. Mm -hmm. um as a coach in Ultimate, you've led a team that uh, that literally won an award for team spirit and for for you know great culture. Um, so as you come into the CEC, obviously you have checklists of tasks you need to complete for mm -hmm. whether it's an upcoming season or to become an official uh, NSO. But for you personally, um, what what are your priorities coming in from a cultural perspective uh, uh, as you enter the CEC? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, um, I want to create a community based culture and I want to be part of an organization that stands on values and uh, that is there to serve the membership and the community. And one of the things I really love about CC, again, from from the start is the values that we have in terms of being athlete centered and community driven. That is very important to me. And I am trying to be as open as possible and as transparent as possible with our PTSO members, with our athletes, coaches, community. And that's something I've been repeating and repeating over and over again for the last year that we're here, we're, we're available, we want to listen, we want to hear what's going on, and we want to put that into action. Um, and I'm supported in that vision and that uh, objective with the board of director and all the staff, everybody's uh, in line with this commitment to the community. Cool. All right. Um, so one one big change in terms of the staffing of, uh, of the CEC is you just recently announced that Libor Rosa uh, is on board mm -hmm. now as the high performance program coach. Uh, I guess he started at the start of February. And interestingly, his contract term is less than a year. It, it technically ends at the end of uh, 2021. So I'm really curious, partially because, you know, it's unlikely that there are going to be any events uh, that are being held. And it, it seems like a really difficult task to, to become a head coach for a program when there's a very high chance you're not going to get face time with a lot of the athletes mm -hmm. you're responsible for. Um, but then from your perspective as well is how, how do you evaluate a coach's performance? you know, on a one year contract, if you just, you know, if, if Libor is somebody who would be in the running to be the coach the year after, how do you really practically, you know, evaluate uh, how he did in his job? Well, I believe there's more to coaching than results and performance. There's also the connection and the relationship that you establish with the athletes. And this year, particularly with the launch of our new high performance program and our Canadian national uh, continuous national ranking, my apologies, uh, LIBOR comes at a time where it's crucial to establish the fundamentals of a new program and to very increase the support that we can give to our high performance athletes. You got to look at this also in where the timeline is in respect to the Olympic cycle. 2021 is the first year of the new Olympic cycle leading up to Paris. 
So that's the year where you want to establish those fundamentals, those support in the development rather than the performance objective. Um, so should we not not uh, the worst thing that happens because performance is not the only object objective in the first and second year of the quad. We're looking at developing and seeing how our athletes can grow. Uh, and there's so much more than just their strength on the wall. There are also their mental health, their physical strength and their physical health. And all of that, Libor, will be a big, big uh, support and a really important piece of building that that program for this year so with the uh with the uh continuous national ranking being published and you guys have made an an, an intake into the the hpp using that um mm -hmm. is the priority of the high performance program in this current scenario where um you know there's there's very little coach interaction but also there's a lot of athletes that don't have access to a facility like even still today um is it's like, what are his functional priorities for managing this, like a very diverse group of climbers, um, mm -hmm. some of whom, honestly, I don't know what their what their training has actually looked like for the last year. Like, you know, it's very easy to make school a priority or, or just not worry about climbing when your gyms have been closed for like most of the year. So how, how is he supposed to approach that kind of task? Yeah, so basically what we're asking Libor right now is to connect individual with each individually with each athlete and have those conversations with the athletes. Basically ask them, where are you at in your training? What are your objectives for this year and the short future? And how can we, CEC, better support you in those priorities that you're setting for yourself? So we're not creating a program that's very dictative. We're not telling the athlete, this is what you have to do in order to qualify for Paris. But rather, we're telling them, how can we best support you in your training plan? Uh, a big objective of that as well is for Libor to connect with all those individual club coaches. So those athletes have been working for many years with their own personal coaches in some cases. And we're asking Libor to connect individually with each of those coaches and say, what are the resources that you need from CEC? What are you missing in your training development approach with those athletes? Is there any education or resources that we can provide you to support your day-to-day -day role with those athletes? So we're really taking a collective approach to the high performance program this year and see where does that take us? I think we've learned over the last year that flexibility and adaptability are two of the most important thing right now so we're going to have to continue in that motion for 2021 and see what happens um you mentioned that libor is on contract until the end of 2021 uh, also there's some reality when it comes to finances and resources that we can allocate to the high performance program that are in the current context extremely uncertain so we're putting forward a program, a coach, an interaction, even though it's not super uh, financially viable to do so right now. But we're taking the stand that it is an important thing to do. And we're going to have to reevaluate at the end of 2021 how we move forward with this program, with this approach and with our finances. So Libor is going to be a very big part of helping us understand. And he's bringing so much to the table already within two months on the job. He's just changing our direction and point of view in that program as well. So it's been very good. What's your read on on the like participation of athletes in Canada right now? Because something I've, you know, I, I'm, I'm not involved with uh, uh, competitive climbers uh, really anymore, but from a couple of the friends that I talked to, there is a, a little bit of nerves that, you know, their programs are going to be diminished just in terms of participation. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if any of the PSOs or PTSOs now um, feel the same way, but do you, have you guys gotten a sense from, from your, your coaches that, that, that there may be like a, a, a bit of attrition in, in the field of competitors in Canada? I think... There, there's the pandemic is kind of a I don't want to say that, but it's kind of a good timing for us in a way that, uh, again, coming into a new quad and being a sport that was growing over the, the last couple of years and having such a strong youth base of competitive climbers, I think participation will not be so much affected uh, when it comes to returning to training and returning to competition plans. 
It's it's also hard for me to answer this question because when it comes to participation at the grassroots level, we don't have a lot of data. We don't have a lot of statistic as to how many climbers are actually in Canada and how many competitive, how many athletes or participants are registered in competitive programs. Those are the kind of data at the grass level, grassroots level that we don't have. So we can only base on what's going on at the provincial and territorial level and what's going on at the national level. We were growing, the sport was increasing in participation. Uh, the exposure that we'll get from the Tokyo Olympic is probably going to have a trickle down effect and just increase that participation as well. So I think we're going to come out on the other side of the pandemic probably picking it up where we left off and continue to grow within the sport. Uh, but that is, again, assumption and based on what I can see, but very lack of data to justify what I'm, I'm proposing here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Speaking of um, growth and participation, the interesting question for me is paraclimbing. Um, I intend on doing some content around how gyms approach uh, adaptive climbing, uh, but mm -hmm. uh, since I have you here, um, paraclimbing is something that kind of, uh, you know, it's it's barely visible in Canada. Our, our, if you talk about who our, our best paraclimbing athlete is, she doesn't even live in the country, right? Um, so, you know, given that we don't run any events for it, um, the there can't be any participation because we, we don't run events for it. What are like, what are the first concrete steps you take to, let's say our priority, like it is with, with the other disciplines is achieving top 15 results or ultimately or let's say one day earning a, a gold medal at a world championship. What are those first steps that, that you guys feel like you have to take to actually start growing a, a proper scene in Canada for paraclimbing? Yeah, thanks for bringing that up, Tyler. Actually, that's something I'm very passionate about, and I want to see uh, Climbing Escada Canada take a stronger lead when it comes to adaptive climbing. Um, so I've done a little bit of research and consultation about what's what exists in Canada when it comes to adaptive climbing. So I've talked to the Canadian Adaptive Climbing Society. I spoke with Access Quebec and other uh, organizations that are doing some education on the ground in, in that respect. So this year for 2021, uh, the big steps we're taking is, first of all, we've added paraclimbing to our strategic plan, our 2024 strategic plan that was recently released. It is part of our strategy priorities to increase uh, involvement and programs in paraclimbing. So to put it down on paper in our plan, I think that's a very big step. Um, the other step we're taking is we will be launching um, a paraclimbing committee within CEC and we will be inviting application for the community, for members on the committee to help us support the creation of those programs and directions. So we're going to bring experts around the country to sit around the table and talk about what should be the next step. How do we go about creating those programs, identifying those athletes, supporting those athletes, and making Canada participate and be present at those paraclimbing World Cup and World Championship? Uh, in the past, I know all we've done was endorsing athletes to attend those events, and now we want to do more. We want to be able to identify those athletes, support them, and also provide the climbing community, um, thinking about the climbing facilities, some resources, education, support in terms of understanding what it takes to be an accessible facility uh, for adaptive climbing. So that's going to be a big priority of ours in 2021. All right. Um, one of my favorite announcements to come out of the CEC through the whole pandemic period was, I, I think it got kind of, at least in my area, it got overshadowed by the fact that we went back into another lockdown. So everybody just kind of tuned <laughs> out. But there was the announcement that you guys were seeking requests for proposal for a Canadian stop on the USA Climbing National Series uh, circuit, which a lot of people always talk about trying to get more integration between the states and Canada, because especially for Canadians, it's just a, a more local way to, to get our talent competing against uh, talent at, at a higher level in, in most cases. Um, where does that stand right now? Like, presumably, the 2021 season is not going to happen, um, or at least we're 
I, I, that is a guess. So I saw your eyebrows there. So I might be wrong. So if, if how are things going for a possible 2021 season? But are the channels still open for that to be a possibility in 2022? Well, you'll be very happy to see our announcement coming out in the co next couple of weeks. All right. Uh, Yes. So basically, uh, it is very important to me, partnership, networking, collaboration, as I said before, these are very important things to me. And it, start, it, it works also at the national level. So I've been in very frequent communication with the CEO of USA Climate, Mark. Uh, Mark Norman, we've been uh, basically on weekly calls for months now. Uh, we created that relationship and that partnership between our organization to support each other and learn from each other. Um, so the North American Cup, uh, so we're not calling it a national USA national series, it's, it's a North American Cup. So it's really our two countries collaborating into a new circuit that we want to develop. This is uh, in order to target, as you mentioned, that higher level, but not the highest level, but that middle step between our national champions and our international athletes in order to help our athletes get those opportunities for developments that were not present uh, before. So we are going ahead for 2021, uh, at least hoping that things are not going to go worse, but actually continue to progress on a positive uh, trend. Uh, we are going to have five stop within this series, including two in Canada and three in the States. So this is happening. Uh, we are uh, working right now, Mark and I, on... Um, Defining the details, we have a committee set working on the rules, including Canadian and U.S. participation to defining the role of the circuit, uh, the rules, sorry, of the circuit. We are currently working on budget being my biggest challenge to actually make it work financially. Um, but yes, it is happening with Five Stop this year. That's going to be an open uh, registration to any Canadian and U.S. athletes and any other athletes, actually, I would like to attend uh, our goal of Mark and I is really to create that Pan-American opportunity for athletes to participate a little more locally than internationally um, in, in their development pathway. So we did invite all the Pan-American countries to include STOP in the circuit. Unfortunately, there wasn't an interest in 2021, but we see this grow into maybe uh, a North American and a South American challenge. Uh, series that will connect into a Pan-American championship. So we want to be part of the solution and bring more opportunities for the athletes on, on Pan-American soil. Even with, uh, with the previous model where it was four or five stops just in the United States, and at that point, I think it was just bouldering as well. Um, there was mm -hmm. a bit of a struggle to actually get a lot of the best boulderers in the States to come out to some of these events. And that's just like domestic travel. And that's not necessarily even in the World Cup season. That's just in like outdoor climbing season. Sometimes people would rather be, you know, uh, you know, out in uh, Joshua Tree or whatever. Um, so a, a big concern for me, it's going to be a great opportunity for whoever goes regardless, but it works best when you have our top, you know, the, the top eight hypothetically from Canadian bouldering nationals and the top eight from, from the U S and whatever other countries. Um, when you guys talk about, you know, trying to, to make this an attractive offering for those athletes, what, uh, what are, what are the priorities? And I'm, I'm assuming the finances become a big limitation because I imagine mm -hmm. the best incentive is prize money. Um, but, uh, how, how does that discussion go? Let me very, be very frank here, but I don't think this series actually targets our top athletes. Our top four or five athletes will be on the IFSC circuit during that time. Uh, this is not really meant, this series is not meant for that level. This series is really meant to address that step just a little below, you know, those athletes that wish they were on the international circuit, but still don't have enough CNR points or not have enough um development opportunity to get to that level so we're talking just a slightly bit under those top athletes and that becomes such a great opportunity for development and we're talking about allocation of cnr points for those events so it becomes an avenue to get more points to be on the high performance program as well 
Uh, with Mark, we're also talking about sharing resources when it comes to root setting. So we're going to be bringing an American root setter into our team for our Canadian stuff. And we're going to be sending a Canadian root setter into their team for the American stuff. So that way we're going to be also able to develop that other side. Because we always focus on developing our athletes, right? And in order to develop our Canadian community, we also need to look at the development of our root setters, our officials, our belayers. And that goes into creating more opportunity for them to be on the ground and active in serving the athletes. And that exchange of knowledge with the state would also help us grow into our capability, uh, abilities to host those events as efficient as possible. Um, when this grows, also, we're hoping to be able to help our South American friends in, in sending some root setters and officials to create those education moments for them as well. So there's there's a holistic approach to these events that is not just bring the top athletes. There's more to that. There's all that development that uh, happens during those steps as well. Hmm. Okay. Uh, kind of on the same topic then, uh when the Canadian national or when the continuous national ranking was published, it didn't make mention of CEC regional events. Um, is it safe to say that with one, you know, a new PTSO member two with this new uh, uh, North American cup circuit, that regionals are going to be no longer part of the CEC calendar, or is that something that's actually going to keep happening? We're gonna keep uh, we're gonna keep regionals, uh, but we are currently in the process of revamping our entire calendar and our entire series. So we're rethinking every of those events and looking at what are the purposes and objectives of each event, and who do they speak to. As the sport grow, you're gonna have we're going to have to make some tough choices and national is probably going to start being smaller in field and higher in caliber. And all those, again, upcoming athletes that may not be able to make it to national at that time, regionals will become their objective and their highest level of achievement. So we just, we, we still going to look at, we're, we're still keeping regional, but we're definitely and definitely need to revamp, to rethink what is the goal and who are they targeting? So again, uh, one of the things, for example, we're talking about now is creating multiple pathway to national. In the past, you had the, you go local, you go to your provincial, you go to your regional, you go to your national, everybody goes the same way. And then you have to set your regional event for those top five athletes. And a lot of kids are not able to reach those stuff because it is being set for higher caliber athletes. What we're going to be looking at, and it's the discussion is in progress right now, we're hoping to have some conclusion and publish um, some, um, the 2021-2022 calendar in, May, uh, in April or May. Um, but what we're going to look at is multiple avenues to national. So you're going to be those top CNR athletes are going to get an invitation directly to nationals. Then you're going to have those top provincial athletes getting an invite directly to national. And then everybody else will be invited to regional where the regional setting is going to be made more for that middle tier of athletes in order to better define who's who within that that middle range. So at that point, regional becomes so much more meaningful for the athletes that are actually attending rather than just being something you have to do to get to nationals. So all of this is currently in the works, and I think the community will be f very happy with, with what we're going to put forward. All right. That, that's the kind of idea that I think I would be as you know, my, my only role in this in this stream in the last couple of years has been working for a gym that hosts the regionals. And it has sometimes <laughs> felt like a, a bit of a pointless, but very like work intensive exercise. So uh, so I'm glad there's some rethinking uh, going around that. That sounds exciting. Um, let's uh, let's shift gears a little bit. Um, I was trying to find a question that would kind of segue nicely. But but at this point, I'm kind of <laughs> kind of uh, moving. Actually, um, well, yeah, we'll move on uh, like normal. So in, in the past, the CEC has this history of being run mostly by um, uh, West Coast volunteers. Um, and then 
has in the past also failed. And a lot of this is because, again, they were volunteers. Like until very recently, the CEC didn't have paid staff. Um, there was a lot of opportunities for transparency that, that didn't really happen. And so th there became these geographic rifts just because some people out in our end of the country didn't really know anybody or um, it didn't have those, those same conversational daily connections with people that were running the organization. Um, now you're an East Coaster yourself, uh, so so that kind of changes things a little bit. We've now got a bit more of a power center on this side of the country, but on top of that, especially in the last couple uh, of uh, well, the last couple months, there's you guys have been publishing so much stuff that increases the level of transparency and um, uh, just makes very clear outlines for how decisions are made, particularly in athlete selection right now. Um, but I'm curious if you find there are still any weak spots in building that trust and in your strategic plan, you talk about uh, engagement and communication. Uh, are there still any pressure points that you feel like there's there's a lot more work that needs to be done? You know, I think um, you, you, your presentation of this question is spot on. Um, we are fighting against historic perspective that things are the way they are and they have for different reason, they have been the way they are. and. You know, you probably heard this saying before, but it takes three positive to counter one negative, right? So it takes time. I'm not expecting things to change tomorrow morning. And I think we've been doing an amazing job at being more transparent, communicative uh, of all national perspective. And also I, I'll add to that bilingual representation, I think have increased it tremendously in the last year. But that's one of my personal I was going to say, uh, that's almost entirely expertise. you, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, very, very important to me that as a national organization, we do all our communication bilingually as well. So that's something that uh, we've been working on. But when it comes to uh, transparency, I, I'm personally an open book and I want the CEC to be an open book. We are a member based organization. We're there for the members. Uh, we want to hear the members. We want to be part of that uh, solution and that that force of change. One other thing we've done a lot in the past year is we um, meet monthly and quite often biweekly now with the provincial our provincial partners. And not just the recognized members. So as you know, we have uh, BC, Alberta, Ontario, and Quebec for a long time. Now we just announced that we're including Climb Yukon in this, which is amazing. But we have an emerging PTSO mentorship program in which we have Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Nova Scotia. So we are increasing, and they are invited to our me monthly meeting, and we are increasing communication and transparency with our provincial partners. If you were to ask them today, what is CET working on, they will be able to tell you. They know everything. They have been consulted on everything that we've been doing. Every program, every new initiative has went through the PTSO first to get their feedback. We also increase the role of the Athlete Commission in which we ask the Athlete Commission feedback on every single prog program and project that we are running. And communication with our board of director also, they we are doing monthly reports and we're making sure that they are aware and informed and educated on what the operation side of things are. So basically anybody involved with the, the CEC right now becomes an ambassador, knows the deep down thing of nitty gritty of how things are working and everybody can speak on behalf of the CEC. So in that way, we're doing more of a balance in the country representation because we have people on those groups that are from everywhere and we are able to get on the ground and tell you what's what and listen as well and bring that feedback up to the operation level. Hmm. Speaking of the, the PTSOs, if anybody had asked me what the next province, because <laughs> it would be a province, if you asked me what the next province to be yeah. to come on board, I probably would have guessed Probably Nova Scotia, um, but maybe maybe one of the prairie provinces. But if you had said it was going to be the Yukon that comes on board as the as the next actual official PTSO, that would have knocked me knocked me right out. So can you talk a bit I'm about? So happy. Yeah, I'm so happy. It, for I them. I, I haven't looked a lot into it, but it seems like they really got lucky with some particular personnel that had the experience and and um, 
really made some some big moves to to get them recognized. Could you talk a little bit about that process and why they got to where they are, but you have those other provinces still kind of at a, uh, I think you said emerging uh, status. So like, how does that whole system work? Well, the big difference between Clam Yukon and the other three that I'm working with is that they've already had that organization set up for a couple of years. Clam Yukon have existed for many years now. Um, so it, they're not starting from zero. They they just need to they needed to be in touch with us and really understand what it means to be affiliated with CEC and to be a member of CEC. So I've met with them multiple times and we went through the bylaws and we talked about the process and we talked about the pros and cons and the roles and responsibility of each NSO versus PTSOs. Um, and the other big thing I would say is, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the Canada Games, uh, which is a multi-sport um, event that happens every two years in Canada, which is, is big, very big for this 16, 18 kind of level. Um, but right now the Canada Games are considering the, the application, sports application for the 2027 Winter Canada Games, which will be held in Yukon. And surprisingly, the government of Yukon has highlighted sports climbing as one of their top targeted sport that they would like to see included in the Canada Games. And as climb a Yukon as a winter sport. <laughs> as in on the sure, winter whatever. series, yes. Yeah, okay. It, it works. Yeah, it works in our development, actually. It works very well because summer being so much outdoor and being IFSC season, winter actually fits very well for our development for our athletes. Um but yeah, the, the government of Yukon has been pushing for the inclusion of climbing and the government is working right now on uh, getting funding to build a bouldering facility in Yukon. So that and Sports Yukon being involved with that, uh, they've approached Climbing Yukon and say, well, one of the things you need to do is be a member with your NSO. So there's a lot of politics that goes behind the scene as well. But all of that put together when you you talk about these things and you meet and you share knowledge and resources and you, you understand where is that going to take you, then it became easier for Climb Yukon to realize, well, yeah, we got to do this. This this is a path forward. And they decided to make a full application to become a member. Interesting. Um, so so what what of those steps are, are you uh, missing from those other uh, provinces? Because a lot of those provinces have been sending athletes already for, for a yep. while. Does it really just come down to they haven't found that right mix of personnel that are willing to put in the work to go through, you know, the big ordeal that is, is kind of making these things happen? <laughs> or where are they at in that uh, in that um, in that road to, to, to being on the same. Yeah, level. it's a lot of work, right? Um, so basically, uh, what they need to do and what they're doing right now is, first of all, is incorporating an organization that will have the mandate of developing sport climbing in their province. So that first step, it's not hard, but it's a lot of paperwork and it's a lot of filing information and getting the right volunteers, setting a board of director, meeting regularly and, and doing those steps. Uh, Manitoba actually has completed everything last year, so they created the Climbing Association of Manitoba, um, which has a full board of director meeting regularly. So I'm seeing them, their growth, and I think they are the next one to come on board with this. Um, Nova Scotia as well, they created uh, recently, they uh, did a partnership with Climb Nova Scotia to create a subsection of Climb Nova Scotia that will be the Eastern, no, East Coast Competitive Climbing, ECCC. That one's a mouthful, but ECCC, uh, will, they will be serving the entire Maritime provinces uh, at, that, at that point. So they are in the process right now of writing their charter and defining their board of directors. And I know um, Dominic Hurst is doing amazing leadership work, but she needs help. So they're, they're in the process of recruiting more volunteers to help lead the development of that organization. So anybody listening from uh, Maritimes, please reach out to Dominique or reach out to me and I can put you in contact. But at this point, all they need is uh, volunteers to be sitting on those board of director and determine what are the mandates and objective that they want to do in the next couple of years. How, how would that work if you had a, a body that was representing multiple provinces uh, sitting as a member in the CEC? Does that does that cause I know this is a really technical question that nobody cares about, but like, does that does that does that cause any 
problems for how voting works or like athlete represent uh, does that change anything yeah nobody cares about i care about those things so much <laughs> um it, it's definitely a different challenge but uh the way it works on paper is that they are a nova scotia based organization and uh to be a member you can be a member from anywhere in the Maritimes, but you have to be a member of Climbing Nova Scotia. Okay. So you have to pay your membership and you have to be on that registration platform. And to be a director on the board of that organization, you have to be Nova Scotia based. Right. So basically they are in theory a Nova Scotian organization, but they are accepting and addressing the needs of everybody in that region. That's a good approach in order to grow that participation and, and that demographic in, in the Maritimes. But what I would like to see from that is from a, a couple of years from now is seeing those provinces saying, well, thank you for helping us grow. Now we're ready to take the stand and be independent on our own and create our own organization. So it's a lot of sports have went through this process. The Maritime is not, it's, this situation is not unique to climbing. So many other sports have done through this development process. I can cite you, um, Canoe Kayak Canada. I know for a long time it was the, the Atlantic region uh, Canoe Kayak Club. And now they're starting to split into multiple provinces because they reached that uh, growth level where they have the members and the need of creating those multiple organizations. So it's not uncommon. Uh, it's definitely politically speaking, a little bit complicated uh, in mm -hmm. terms of representation and all that, but it's, it, it's doable. And I think they're doing a great job at setting the, the groundwork for that. Cool. Oh, that's crazy here. Um, one, one of the areas of, of the, um, of the strategic plan that, that I was uh, uh, a bit disappointed to see missing. So like just as a, as a fan and as a spectator, but also as somebody that I, I like to do some broadcasting stuff with, uh, with climbing events, uh, I was a little bit sad. It didn't address growing an audience for the sport directly, uh, or it didn't mention any goals for, for broadcasting Canadian events uh, or improving production or anything like that. Um, or even, and this is something I've kind of had to like rib this, the IFSC for is, um, you know, I, I don't know who else is supposed to be the resource for having a really good database of results and uh, history of the sport in Canada and eventually, hopefully, some more fun statistics for nerds to dig through. Um, and none of that was, was really mentioned in the strategic plan. Um, I understand on a giant list of priorities, only some of them are going to get mentioned, but because it, it wasn't really mentioned at all, I'm just curious on, you know, if the CEC is has really any concern with trying to grow the sport f for spectators, for viewers, um, or if it's kind of, if this is going to be one of those sports where, where the whole sport is consigned to just being for those people who participate in it. All right, can you uh, hear me? Yeah, sorry, Tyler, you That's froze okay. for a few seconds here. Um, so I, I heard you mentioning uh, those missing pieces in the strategic plan. Um, so yeah, I think if, if I heard everything you said in that frozen moment. <laughs> um, so basically, yeah, there, there are choices that we need to make. Uh, let's face it, we're only two full-time employees. We have a operation budget that's 600,000 pre-pandemic. So we're not massively big and we cannot take on everything that we dream of taking on, which you're absolutely right. Those are very valid points. Uh, so first of all, yeah, there are strategic choices. But that if it's not a strategic plan, it doesn't mean it's not going to happen. So as part of hosting our events in our heaven budget, there is always that section for broadcasting and streaming the events. That is 100% something that is going to continue happening. Even more, let's face it, there's possibly a, a good chance that for our first events we're going to host this year, if we do, there's not going to be an spectator uh, uh, option because because of the pandemic and we don't know how long that's going to last so streaming is extremely important and that's going to retain uh so basically as part of my massive portfolio and everything that i'm trying to do and trying to achieve i've been in communication with different broadcast companies so instead of simply making that a streaming option we're going to target one or two events to be actually broadcasted in a very high level quality 
sporting event so that we can showcase and use those pieces to showcase our sport to organizations like CBC and uh, TSN and so on. Um, so there is definitely some approaches. I've had conversation with uh, some of our commenta- commentators in the past to to see what could we do more in that respect. It does come down to money. Uh, there are some choices to be made uh, as well in that respect. But it is there. Um, you mentioned also the national uh, database. So with the um, with the implementation of the CNR, we're currently gathering quotes to see how much would it cost us to create a national database. We've talked with the pro- province and territories about that and creating an aligned database and registration system that would be the same throughout Canada. Uh, where we would have all our data, all our information centralized in that one area uh, that the province could access. And even ideally, the climbing community, the climbing facility could access as well and input their participation numbers in in that registration system. So we've had a couple of talks with different firms and different software company that would be able to do that for us. So again, I think if, even if it's not on the strategic plan and you believe that it should have been, never hesitate to reach out to us and say, well, what about this priority? What ab- what are you guys doing about this? And as being transparent as we're, we are and trying to be, we're going to provide you with the answers and, and those questions and, and where the steps that we've taken and where we're at at this time. All right. This this provides a good a good segue into just talking about money. The, the fourth pillar ah. of the... Uh, of the strategic the plan. Question. The big question yep. is, is all about the money. So uh, before we dive into it, could you just give a, a, a very approximate breakdown of of uh, what your your largest sources of revenue uh, are right now, and then also what the largest expenditures are? Sure. Um, basically, our revenue is mostly split in three parlors. Uh, so we have membership and athlete license. With, to be fair, those three parlors pre-pandemic, so we have a pre and a post pandemic mm-hmm. situation for sure. Uh, but pre pandemic, they were very one third, one third, one third. So athlete license and pro- province membership. Then we had a sponsorship and government funding. At, in that respect, so during the pandemic, one our biggest challenge is that we lost two third of our revenues. Uh, we lost athlete members licenses because we were not able to host any events, so we're not going to start charging licenses. And we lost, uh, as you know, uh, MEC MEC uh, Mountain Improvement Co-op. Unfortunately, went uh, got sold, so we lost that sponsorship, which was a big sponsorship for us. So it it creates a di- very difficult situation where right now our only revenue is from government funding, which has been Sports Canada has been an amazing partner, and they are um, doing everything that they can to support us financially, which is is great, very good to see. Uh, but it's it's been challenging for the last year to say the least. In terms of expenses, uh, in a normal year, again, I'd say hosting events uh, is is a big expense. And what a lot of people don't understand or don't know is that we lo- we lose event on every single event that we host. Uh, we're not making money. We're not making a profit on those, unfortunately. So there's a big conversation to be had about restructuring the finances of our events so that at least we break even. And we don't want to have to do that by increasing the cost. Like that's the last thing we want to do is increase the cost of participation. So the alternative, it looks for sponsorship and decreasing the expenses, but then we don't want to decrease the quality of the service. So we want to keep the expenses where they are. So that kind of part of all the challenges that we're facing. Then I'd say the other big aspect of uh, expenses is operation so we are at the end of the day a business it's an organization so we have some expenses in terms of financial auditing financial management legal perspective governance uh, staff payroll so that is also a significant bucket that we have to um, consider we do everything we can to keep costs low. Like we don't have an office, as you see. I'm in in my beautiful basement with the kids' toy in the corner and trying to kind of keep it as professional as possible. Uh, so we are definitely 
finding ways to operate at a very, very, very low cost. All right. So the, the, the two models that I look at in comparison would be like the IFSC's model, which is obviously like a very mature model, um, mm -hmm. very different way of funding events, which is probably not applicable to the, to the CEC. Um, and then also the U.S. model, which is probably a little bit closer, but they have the, the benefit of really just having that one national body that isn't subdivided into into uh, uh, PTSOs in our case. Um, w with the U.S., where where the the largest bulk of their revenue is is one from from memberships and and registration fees, but then also I think they cracked a million last year in terms of sponsorship. <laughs> which is great for them. Yeah. And then the IFSC, on the other hand, is is largely broadcast rights. So that's something that is obviously not in our wheelhouse just yet, maybe mm -hmm. one day. Um, what, you know, uh, what are you targeting in terms of, of revenue and what kind of model is, are either of those models something you, uh, you would like to aim for as a sustainable model for the CEC or is there some other uh, path? Yeah, just a, a quick word on USA Climbing. So I had this conversation with Mark Norman actually this week and asked him if he was willing to share some numbers with me to to help us understand the scope of what Canada can do versus what the US has. Um, and he, he, he willingly shared numbers and he said those numbers are public, so it's there's no concern about sharing those numbers. But just to give you an idea of the size of USA Climbing, our pre-pandemic operation budget was six hundred thousand dollars. Theirs was five point nine million. Mm -hmm. So right there, that's a massive difference. And when it comes to membership uh, athlete license, we barely broke five hundred pre-pandemic. They are at fifteen thousand. So that put in perspective a little bit what we can achieve um, with uh, our finances. Um, for us, sponsorship is a big one that we are trying to tackle better. Um, we have an exciting announcement coming up at the end of March, so stay tuned for that. We have signed a new partner, um, so that's that's very good. We are looking at more avenues when it comes to sponsorship, private donors, um, corporate. Also, Sports Canada being a great partner, there's a way for us to... Uh, wait, there's a path for us to potentially triple the funding that we get from Sports Canada should we ever get to all those little check marks down the list. Um, but the other big thing that we need to consider as a sport organization is we need to open the dialogue to more than just competitive athletes. Uh, climbing as Canada's mandate is yes to support high performance first and foremost, but in order to support a, a sustainable high performance, you have to look at that grassroots development and that community participation, because four years from now, those are going to be the high performance athletes that we're looking at. So there is this partnership with the local communities, the climbing facilities, the, the clubs out there, all this participation in Canada, there's need to be a little more thought put into that alignment from the grassroots to the PTSOs to the NSOs. And down with the resources and education going down to the PTSO and all the way down to the community. So that chain of sharing resources, um, information, education has to go both ways. And there is a potential there for some financial support from the community to the PTSO first and then to the NSO. Other models exist in Canada in that respect. So uh, that's something we're starting the conversation. We're not imposing anything tomorrow morning. That's absolutely not going to happen that way. We're going to be in a conversation with provincial and community level partners. We are looking at what other model exists, uh, like you mentioned, IFSC, USA Climbing, but maybe other countries that have different approach. Uh, that are more our scope of business, but also other sports and what they do. And I think that's one of the things I brought to the table coming in from another sport and another background is what exists in the Canadian sports system that may be interesting for us as well. And just expanding our, our horizon and having those conversations with every stakeholder in, in our sport. 
Can you talk a bit more about um, about the relationship between between a grassroots level, which I, I kind of think of myself as like the gym level, where it's you know those mm-hmm. those customers who their entire relationship with climbing is is what they learn in the gym, is the people they meet in the gym, is the staff. So from 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 the gym level to the the PSO level uh, to the national level, um, you know what a, a question I have to ask is like what value does not just the exactly. CEC, even the PTSOs actually offer mm-hmm. to me 11 years ago in oversized rental shoes. Like what, you know, what is that relationship <laughs> where you have these customers who are the most enthusiastic about the sport? They couldn't be happier to have this as a part of their life. They are constantly learning. They're always looking for new information and videos on YouTube. It's like it's, it is their favorite thing in life at the moment. What what value can these like provincial and national organizations actually offer to these people? Yeah, I'm, I'm very happy you asked that, Tyler, because that's that's the point. That's the conversation. That's where we need to start is establishing what is the value that CEC brings to this community level and what the PSO brings to the community level. Um, one of the basically, if you look at the sport development pillar of a national sports organization, that's something we in the last year have done so much progress on. And that's something prior to me coming on board, maybe wasn't as focused as it could have been. Um, When we talk about coach education, when we talk about long term athlete development training, when we talk about root setters, belayers, official education, all of those pillars are something extremely valuable that the NSO can do to support the growth of the sport. Um, We've started this year, we are almost ready to launch our athlete development matrix. So this is a list, tremendous resource for coaches. It's a super long list of skills. And what are the targeted level in an athlete's development as to when you should introduce those skills and refine those skills. So that's a tool that will help the coaches develop their curriculum and how they approach their training and make training more consistent throughout the country so that when the kids arrive at the national provincial level and then national level, they're all at the same place in their development. Uh, Picture basically what happened in the school system. Every kid in grade one, regardless where they are, have learned the same thing before they can move on to grade two. So basically, that's the same thing that we're trying to become more of a guide and provide those resources for the community level. Uh, Coaches training when it comes to the National Coach Certification Program, the NCCP, that's something we are working very hard with Coaching Association of Canada to try to get ourselves into the door and get uh, the ability to start building those coaching programs that are recognized by the National Coaching Association so that a climbing facility can tell parents, yeah, all my coaches are NCCP certified. That's a rubber stamp of quality for the parents to know if I put my kid there, my kid is going to be safe and well uh, coached. Um, When it comes to safe sport resources, we're putting in place so many policies and processes to help ensure um, a a positive and inclusive environment in the national level, but the provincial and community level as well by proposing safe sport training and screening of all of our coaches. We need to be careful about the jurisdiction, jurisdiction, sorry, jurisdiction of where the CEC works. But there are a lot of things that we can do in a recommendation basis and say this is what CEC puts forward and we know it would make your sport better and your services better for your members. So we really highlight those as great tools for you to use and and put forward. Um, Those are just examples, but I I can think we just launched the gender equity grant last year and we offered $6,000 in grants for community-based gender equitable projects. And I'm happy to say that we're going to do this again in 2021 because it has been extremely positive for the community. As we grow our revenue, I can see a facility development grant. Uh, So something, again, a a pocket of money that, that facility can apply to help buy new equipment or develop uh, new um, resources. So we we want to be a factor of change. We want to impact positive growth. And that becomes something we need to do in partnership by adding value to what the services exist in the community. 
And we want to engage in that conversation. We're going to launch a consultation model again this year and, and, and get more feedback for the community and have those conversations as to what is the value of CC. So there's a lot of thing that comes in play there, but we we need to determine that before we go anywhere else in a membership model structure system that we could do. I wasn't going to bring this up, uh, uh, but you, you kind of touched on it. Um, was uh, You mentioned something like a facility development grant. Um, uh, and something that's been talked about for a couple of years is is a system for um, identifying. Uh, I think I think the term was national training facility <laughs> or center. I can't remember exactly what the what the term was, but basically an approved facility that I'm assuming just has to meet a certain amount of benchmarks for for literally what uh, facilities they have to offer. You know what training uh, uh, training equipment and and the I'm guessing the size or the you know root setting supplies of the walls and things like that um if you pick like any pocket in canada there are uh areas that have particular strengths and particular weaknesses um i know for for ontario a big weakness for us is we have no 15 meter speed facilities and our lead facilities at a world cup level are extremely limited um we have a like a maybe just one gym at the moment that has walls big enough um but you know, World Cup route setting is a crazy expensive <laughs> priority. And I, I, I completely understand that this gym doesn't want to put that kind of money in it because mm -hmm. it's basically <laughs> charity at that point. Um, what what are those conversations like? Because frankly, they're, and I, I don't want to say it's an issue of fairness because these strengths and weaknesses are almost completely the, the decision of private business owners. It really comes mm -hmm. down to the gym owner, right? It's... Um, it's uh, it's up to them whether or not they want to invest in something as small as a campus board or something as big as a 15 meter speed wall or a, a, an expensive route setting program. Um, and I know you speak to a lot of gym owners. They're part of your, your stakeholder meetings. Um, you know, is there is there any way to incentivize each region really addressing their weaknesses when ultimately you're just trying to convince like private members to spend more of their own money? Like how I'm assuming with the current financial reality, it is not an option to try to subsidize development. But do you have ways of trying to, to get that government funding kind of in the way the Yukon is for their facility? It's that is such a big challenge, a hundred percent. It's I, I'll quote actually. I'll, I'll take a second here to quote uh, Andrew Wilson, our high performance program, uh, our high performance director. Sorry, um, I think he says it best when he says, "Imagine a national team swimmer that has to train for the Olympic during public swim at his local pool." Right. So it's we're exactly in that situation where we're asking our top athletes to train in an environment that is not set for the, the level of training that they need. But at the same time, we're in a position where we don't have enough localized high performance athlete for a facility to justify putting that environment in place. So it's a little bit of what comes first. How do we approach this situation? So. It's not something that we can do in the short term. Uh, in the long term, there is a program in place. Uh, Andrew Wilson is working on on the basic of that program. But it would be, as you mentioned, uh, a program to identify those gyms that are willing to do that business model and say our business is focused into helping that high performance athletes. And then identify those centers in in various pockets in Canada. So I can think about Toronto, Alberta, um, Calgary, Vancouver, and then centralizing our high performance athlete within those pockets and say, well, if you want to train at the level that you need to train to perform at the IFSC, those are the facilities that have a business model that will support your training. Um, it's kind of an hybrid model between building our own training center, which it would be great to have an anonymous donation of millions of dollars to do that, but it's not a reality that we can afford. And just leaving the athletes on their own in, in all the centers in Canada and say, go train at public swim. 
So we need to find that hybrid model that will bring us to a compromise by centralizing in some little pockets in Canada. There are gyms that are including this part in their business model and say, we want to support that high level and we will create that space within our environment to do so. So we need to identify those gym and work with them to create it. Hmm. I think if, if it was my responsibility, I would just be trying to like slip a bribe to Josh Larson in Salt Lake City, <laughs> get an apartment down there and see if we can, if we get like from midnight to 8 a.m. and that's the Canadian team training time at the U.S. So yeah, that's probably the only practical option I would uh, be able to give. Okay. Again, I'll bring back their, their operation build jet of 5.9 million. If I can get yeah, that operation sure. jet, I'll, I'll create that space for you. That's not a problem. Yeah. All right. Um, I only have a couple more questions. They're short questions, but they might be a little bit tough. So the first one is uh, it's not in the strategic plan. Um, are you guys interested in bringing a World Cup back to Canada in the medium term future? Depending on what you mean by medium term, the answer Let's say is five, yes. Let's five ish years approximately. Yes. Okay, cool. Uh, and then the so I've I've been uh, again I've been involved much more with the IFSC that I think CEC has been in the past. I've I've been communication with them, uh, involved with the PAC as well, the Pan American Council, and it is our hope to create and and that's what we're doing also with the North American series is to create more opportunity for Canadians to compete on local soil so either Canadian soil or North American soil or Pan American soil and that can lead that can mean by bringing World Cups in Canada then that's definitely something we're going to look into all right and then the last question I've written down is uh as a percentage how certain are you that we're going to see Canadian climbers compete at an Olympic Games this summer? <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's a tough one. Um, I think we're talking about a 99%. Um, the Canadian Olympic Committee has a very robust plan of how to bring our athletes safely to Tokyo. There's um, a lot of communication with um, the IOC in that respect as well. Um, there's absolutely no plan on postponing, canceling the Tokyo Olympic. It's not on the paper right now. Everything leads to a very strict, restricted approach. So it's going to be quite challenging to navigate that puzzle to bring our athletes there, but they will be there. That's great to hear. That's uh, reassuring. <laughs> Cool. Well, Christiane Marceau, the executive director of uh, Climbing Escalade Canada, uh, joining us from uh, from somewhere in or near Ottawa, I guess. Right. Thank you very yeah, much for, yeah. for spending this time. <laughs> it was a great way to start uh, start a Friday morning. So uh, thank you very much for the interview. I appreciate it. My pleasure, Tyler. It was uh, great speaking with you. And if I may just remind everybody uh, through this podcast, Please do not hesitate to reach out. As I said, I'm an open book and I do want people to know the truth and to know the details of what we're doing in order to be able to make their own opinions. So never, ever hesitate. Reach out through social media, email. We're, we're there to uh, take the question and uh, listen and uh, support. Awesome. If you enjoyed this podcast, uh, make sure you leave a like and a comment for the algorithm, uh, or you can support us on Patreon. You can get stickers or you can insert your own questions into these, uh, these podcasts. So thank you to all of our existing subscribers and Patreon donors, and especially uh, to the G5 for their support. Also hop in the Plastic Weekly Discord link down below. So if you like talking about things like the continuous national ranking, we spent a good like three or four days breaking that down, just a group of people that love numbers. So come hang out in the Discord. <laughs> Uh, otherwise, hope you enjoyed this interview and we will see you in the next one.